What is metabolic syndrome and should you blame your belly fat? Well, belly fat has been associated with metabolic syndrome so closely that they believed that belly fat was the cause of metabolic syndrome. But very often that's how it goes when we get cause and effect confused. So today we're going to talk about the real cause of metabolic syndrome and what you can do about it. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Ekberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. So why did they think belly fat was involved? Well, they've often talked about how fat on the middle of the body, the abdominal obesity, is much more dangerous than if you have the extra fat somewhere else. And it is, but it's not because the fat itself is dangerous, it's because of the factors giving rise to it. So why is metabolic syndrome so important? Why do we need to know about it? Because there's over 3 million new cases in the United States alone. There's over 47 million existing cases in the United States. And they're estimating that as much as a quarter of the entire population of the planet are probably affected by metabolic syndrome. Then they will tell you, if you look it up next, that it can't be cured and therefore obviously it's chronic and lifelong. So we're going to examine all of that. Now metabolic syndrome isn't really a thing. It's a label. It's a grouping that they give you. Syndrome basically just means that they're not sure where it comes from, but there's more than one factor involved. So when you have more than one thing going on, then they call it a syndrome. So there's five criteria. One is abdominal obesity. The second is that you have elevated triglycerides, that your blood fats, the triglycerides in your, in your blood are over 150 milligrams per deciliter, that you have elevated blood pressure, that your blood pressure is 130 over 85 or higher, that you have elevated blood glucose, that you're either pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetic. And by the way, 85% of diabetics have metabolic syndrome. And the fifth thing they look at is that if you have a low HDL. So for a woman, a low HDL is below 50. For a man, a low HDL is below 40. And they also define the abdominal obesity as a waist measurement for a woman over 35 inches and for a man above 40 inches. Those are the criteria. And if you have more than three, if you have three or more of these five, then they label you with metabolic syndrome. So it's not really a disease. It's just a cluster of conditions that go together. And it's typical with diseases, especially syndromes, they will tell you that there is no known cause. But let's just look back into the medical textbooks. Let's look at some irrefutable facts that you can look up from a medical textbook, from a book of physiology at any time, and let's see what we find out. So fact number one, carbohydrates are the strongest trigger of blood glucose. Carbohydrates are different forms of sugar. They're quickly absorbed. They raise blood sugar. Next irrefutable fact is that things that raise blood sugar faster, foods that are high glycemic index, will also trigger higher insulin responses. And if we have insulin levels being elevated for a long period of time, the body develops insulin resistance. Once you have insulin resistance, now the cells don't want the glucose, so the glucose rises and we have this nice vicious cycle called insulin resistance that eventually leads to type 2 diabetes. So that is a fact that the more carbohydrates a food contains, the higher the glycemic index. All the glycemic indexes above 50 are high carbohydrate foods. All the indexes above 
60 or 70 or 80 are foods with more carbohydrates. Number two, fact. Insulin stimulates, insulin promotes the conversion of blood glucose to fat. Straight out of the textbook. And the fat is the triglycerides that is one of the criteria for diagnosing the metabolic syndrome. Fact number three, insulin stops fat burning, All right? So insulin promotes fat development, that promotes the manufacture of fat called lipogenesis, and it prevents the burning of fat, lipolysis. So it stores it and it prevents the usage. Fact number four, cortisol is a hormone, it's a stress hormone that raises blood sugar, that leads to insulin resistance, and it is very, very closely causatively associated with belly fat. We know that people with extremely high cortisol levels, for example, in Cushing syndrome, they will have insulin resistance, they'll have belly fat, they have very typical body shapes. So armed with those four facts, let's just look at these. So abdom abdominal obesity. Now we know that that is caused by cortisol and insulin. Triglycerides, we know that that is a result of insulin and insulin resistance and high blood sugar. When the blood sugar can't get into the cells because of insulin resistance, the body needs to do something else with them, so the liver turns the sugar into triglycerides. Number three, high blood pressure. Blood pressure is primarily a function of stress. It is also a component of metabolic syndrome, but more specifically, cortisol and stress will give you high blood pressure. Number four, the elevated blood glucose is a result of carbohydrate consumption and high insulin, just like we see here. Elevated glucose, elevated insulin, insulin resistance, and so forth. And number five, reduced HDL and also increased LDL is a result of inflammation. So when we use these four facts and we look at the criteria, it's pretty plain to see that the cause, the real cause of metabolic syndrome is insulin, inflammation, and stress. So obviously if you want to change your chances, change your manifestation, the adaptation of metabolic syndrome, then you want to work on these three things. But let's look at what is the standard treatment for metabolic syndrome. Well, for abdominal obesity, they tell you lose weight, and then they suggest a healthy diet with, which is high in grains and carbohydrates, which is rich in fruits and low-fat dairy or non-fat dairy. All of these things we know are high glycemic index that will promote insulin resistance. Then they give you statin drugs, for the triglycerides, and they give you statin drugs for the low HDL, for the high LDL. What do statin drugs do? They interfere with the liver's production of cholesterol. And cholesterol, again, is an essential nutrient. It's one of the building blocks for your brain. But the statins, in the process of interfering with the cholesterol, they also interfere with the body's production of CoQ10 coenzyme Q10, and that is the critical enzyme inside the mitochondria that helps the body make energy. So the statins will shut down energy production wherever we have the most mitochondria. And where is that? It's in your brain, your heart, and your liver, because they're the most metabolically active. Now, does that sound like a really great idea if you want to help heart disease? to shut down the energy production in your heart, liver, and brain? Well, I don't think so. So if I would not recommend taking statin drugs, but I'm not a medical doctor, so only you and your doctor can make that decision. But if you are taking any statin drugs, you absolutely have to supplement with high doses of CoQ10. 
So obviously when you shut down energy production in your heart, that's not good for the heart. When you shut it down in the liver, that's not good for insulin resistance and fatty liver. Then for the blood pressure, they give you beta blockers. And for your type 2 diabetes, for your high blood sugar, they give you insulin or insulin promoting medication. So I think by now you see the obvious problem that this problem is caused by insulin and insulin resistance and blood glucose, yet most of the treatment promotes insulin resistance. When you eat a diet high in carbohydrates, then you promote insulin resistance. You make it worse. Same thing with obviously the type 2 diabetes. When they give you insulin, when they trick your cells into becoming more insulin resistant, when they use either insulin or an insulin mimicking drug, then they're increasing the metabolic syndrome. And this is the whole problem. We've talked about this on some previous videos that the treatment of the symptom, which they believe is high blood sugar, reduces the problems with high blood sugar, but it creates the problem of metabolic syndrome. And, and this is why. So and I know it sounds crazy to treat a problem with something that makes the problem worse, but this is what happens when we ignore the root cause and we focus strictly on treating symptoms. And unfortunately, that is the, at the core of the whole healthcare model is to treat symptoms rather than root causes. And then when they look at the situation, they get very confused because they're so focused on the symptoms, they, get, they can't identify the cause and the effect properly. But once we step back and we understand that the causes is insulin, inflammation, and stress, then there is no way to make this any better unless you reduce the insulin rather than increase it. If you reduce the inflammation and you reduce the stress. So how do you do that? Well, in the case of insulin, it's pretty obvious. You reduce the foods that stimulate the most insulin and you reduce the frequency of meals that stimulate insulin. So you eat less sugar, less carbs, and you eat less frequently. That's what we talked a lot about on the channel. You go low carb, keto, and intermittent fasting. Those are the tools to reduce insulin. Then you want to reduce inflammation. So what causes inflammation? Well, in general, sugar, grain, and insulin causes inflammation. Those are in general. More specifically, things that cause inflammation are things that you are sensitive or allergic to because anytime you eat something that your body reacts to, you create inflammation. So the most common things people are sensitive to that I find in my office are grains and processed dairy, pasteurized milk primarily. But there are lots of other things. People can be sensitive to strawberries or fish or nuts or nightshades and then all of those would be inflammatory to you. The third huge thing is stress because stress contributes to insulin and inflammation and stress also obviously produces cortisol. And cortisol is a central component to all this, this belly fat and insulin resistance. So I hope you're seeing this very, very clearly by now that the reason they feel it can't be cured, the reason that it's considered chronic and lifelong is that they're treating the symptom which allows the real problem to get bigger and grow and get worse. And not only are they allowing the problem, but they're treating it with things that further insulin resistance and that's why it can't be cured. But it doesn't need curing, it just needs reversing. It's an adaptation. If you remove the things that promoted the adaptation, then it will go away. So all of these things are signs and symptoms of your body becoming clogged. And if you want to unclog it, then you do, you undo these three things. If you're a little bit clogged, then you might have 
one of these five if you have if you're more clogged then you have three or more but they all go together because the, they have the mechanism of insulin in common if you enjoy that information i'm sure that you're going to love that video thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in the next video